Hey guys, it's Luke Yon, and today I am going to be filming my December wrap-up, talking about all the books that I read in December. I read quite a few books in the month, so let's just not waste any more time and jump right into it. The first book that I read in December was The Little Prince by... I forget the author's name. It's very long. It's like Antoine de say X for that. Um, and this is a book that my Italian professor actually recommended we all read, and it was one that I had really like thought I read just because it's such a it's like a children's classic, but I actually had never read it. So I decided to pick it up, and it was really cute. I ended up giving it four out of five stars. This is a rare like book because I feel like it is, like, it's generally aimed towards children, but I feel like anyone can really read it. Like, of course there are books like that, but I feel like most of those are more like middle grade, so like, you know, stories that are like, are chapter books are what they're typically called, but this one is like, kind of like a picture book. Like, it definitely, from the cover, seems like a very light children's story, but it's actually very deep and emotional. There's a lot of like, important life lessons and values and meanings that I think are important to revisit at any age. So I never felt like this was, I was reading a book that was like talking down to me or that was like too young for me. So overall, I thought this was a really good book and I would definitely recommend it to pretty much anyone. Next, I read Valedictorians at the Gate, Standing Out, Getting In, and Staying Sane While Applying to College by Becky Munster Sapke. This is a book that I like, had on my radar for a while. It's a non-fiction book about, like, the college admissions process, obviously, and I always thought it was interesting because it's actually from a former admissions director, which I thought would be, like, a cool perspective because I am interested in the college admissions fields, even though I am thankfully done with, like, college admissions, like, on the student side. Um, so I just thought this would be, like, interesting to read, and I'm actually glad I did not read it while I was applying to college because I think it would have stressed me out. This is no, like, fault to the author, but I think her perspective a little bit, or sometimes was, like, a tad unrealistic. Like, I know that's kind of a stereotype of these admissions officers, that they, you know, expect the most from students, and she would often, like, chime in throughout the book to be like, I'm not like that, you don't need to be a rocket scientist, you don't need to cure cancer, you don't need to write a Nobel Prize winning book by the time that you're 11 years old. But I feel like often, some, like, I don't know, throughout the book there were just times, and I, I wish I had, like, marked them, but I was reading the ebook because I was at school so I didn't have this with me. Um, I wish I had marked them, the moments where that stood out to me, but I just thought I would mention it because I feel like this would definitely be a book that would, like, make me more anxious about my application if I was actually in the thick of the process. I think if you're looking for a book that is really helpful during the process, I would probably recommend Soundbite by Sarah Harberson. I think it does it way better because it's more encouraging. This book, um, even though it's from the perspective of an admissions officer, I never felt, like, as a student, reassured. Like, she was kind of pointing out, I mean, she's a former admissions director, but there were a lot of times when she would point out, like, this system is super flawed, but she would never kind of, like, reassure the reader in the fact that, like, it all works out in the end. Like, even though it, she does kind of mention that because she had a bad, like, college admissions, like, process or, like, experience where she didn't end up getting into her first, second, third, fourth choice school, like, it ended up great, but I feel like sometimes she would forget that fact about herself, and I don't know, like, there were times where I feel like she would forget what it's like to be a student and only be from the perspective of an admissions officer, and then sometimes she would really only talk about herself. I know this sounds like I'm complaining a lot, I still gave the book four stars because I do think it is a solid, like, book itself about the admissions process, but I'm just saying, like, I would not recommend this for a student like, actually in the process at the moment. Overall, though, I do think there is, like, good advice, and it's interesting to see, like, behind closed doors, um, because you don't often get that point of view. So, I do think this is an important book, and I really liked the author's writing style, even though there were some weird things throughout. Um, I do feel like the book flowed really well, and it also is a really good audiobook, so. And I also like the way it's segmented, um, because it, it just flows very naturally. So, four out of five stars, I have some complaints, but 
they're not like enough to actually take the book down. Next I read The Ruined by Renee Atia. This is the fourth and final book in the Beautiful Quartet, which is a series I have been reading since 2019, actually. I received an arc of the first book in June of 2019, so I read it then, like months before it actually came out, and I have been anxiously awaiting every installment in the series since then, and this is the finale, so I really um, was pumped to see how this series would wrap up. And initially I gave this book 4 out of 5 stars, but I think upon reflection I lowered it to like a 3.5. I just, like, okay, my experience with this book, it's hard to describe because, one, it's hard to describe this series because where we are in book 4 is so drastically different from where we start in book 1, but book 1 basically is about this girl named Celine who has fleed from Paris mysteriously um, and ends up in New Orleans and becomes embroiled in this court of lions which is, you know, at, and at the helm of it is Sebastian um, Saint Germain who is also mysterious. And in this book, you know, tons of stuff has happened um, and we, I, I can't even like try to describe how this book starts because one it would make no sense and two it would be full of spoilers. But throughout the majority of this book I was chilling. I was like this is pretty good. I would give it four stars. I'm super excited to see where the ending goes because I could tell that Renee Octia was like lining up all these dominoes. Like the first three books were really like different stories. Like the first book was really Celine's story. The second book was Sebastian's story and the third book was Pippa and Arjun's story, who were two, like, side characters from the first book, but I think the first three books really set it up so that this book could be a culmination of all those disparate stories and links, um, and it was for the most part in the beginning, like, we got tons of POV chapters and all of that, and I think the first, like, 300 pages, or, like, 325 pages, honestly, of this book were, like, a lot of setup, but I was like, Renee Atia is going to deliver in the end. I've read all of her books at this point, and all of her finales have been really satisfying endings. Like, The Wrath and the Dawn, I didn't love the first book, but the second book was really great. Flame in the Mist, I liked the first book more, but the second book still, like, wrapped everything up in a way that was really satisfying um, and, like, gratifying as a reader. But this book, like, the ending is really just, like, what brought down the story for me. Like, if we were just judging on the first like 320 something pages I'd probably still give this book four stars but the ending was just so rushed and I feel like for being a four book series and with so many characters and like so much lore and all of that stuff like it just wasn't wrapped up in a way that I think was like right for the readers. I do still enjoy the series as a whole and I will still recommend it, but I also know that I'm not alone in criticizing the ending of this book because it was just so fast and like characters were just like forgotten about by the end and the epilogue, like after the final battle there was like a short epilogue at the end that takes place like years later and like tries to wrap everything up but just fails to in my opinion. So I gave it three, three and a half out of five stars. The ending just is what brought stuff down for me. It's hard to explain without spoilers, but I do think I did a good job of, like, articulating my feelings in my Goodreads review, so you can check that out if you want more, like, in-depth thoughts that may go into the realm of spoilers. Then I read What the River Knows by Isabel Ibanez. This is the first book in a Y fantasy, historical fantasy duology that follows a Bolivian-Argentinian girl named Inez, and she has um, these two parents that are always, like, on these Egyptian expeditions, and she has wanted for a while to go on one of these journeys with them, but she has always never been allowed to. But one day she receives a letter that tells her that her parents have gone missing and are presumably dead, and so she decides to take it upon herself to travel to Egypt and um, work with her uncle and his associate to uncover the deaths of her family, and there's a lot of, like, Egyptian mythology incorporated into the story. I really enjoyed this book. I gave it a 4 out of 5 stars. I do want to purchase it, but I want to purchase this edition, specifically the Barnes & Noble edition, because I really like the cover of this more, and I, there's also like extra like bonus content and all that, so definitely want to pick this up soon. 
And I really enjoyed this book. Like, I thought the main character was really interesting. I enjoyed the writing. I liked the setting. I love, like, Egyptian sort of mythology. Um, the pacing was, like, not my favorite, and I do think the book was, like, somewhat clunky at times. But I think overall, like, the story was really engaging, and the, like, setting and Egyptian spin to the book is really what, like, kept me invested the whole time. So even though there were some, like, rockier parts, like, I was still, like, kind of glued to the book, um, even when I wasn't necessarily interested in the actual, like, plots, because the characters were sharp and the writing was really atmospheric. So definitely recommend it, and I'm super excited to, for the next book coming out this year. Well, technically, like, 2024, but, like, you know, you get it. Next, I read Whiteout by Danielle Clayton, Tiffany D. Jackson, Nick Stone, Angie Thomas, Ashley Woodfolk, and Nicola Yoon. This is kind of a companion to the book that they released a couple of years ago called Blackout, which takes place in New York City, and it follows a bunch of characters as there is a major blackout throughout the city. I did not read the, that book yet, but I do definitely want to now, but I was more interested in this book because it takes place in Atlanta during a snowstorm, and I'm way interested in snowstorms than blackouts because blackouts just, like, stress me out, but snowstorms, at least there's, like, a winter sort of, like, cozy vibe to them. And I went into this book, I actually thought that it was going to be like six separate stories, each one like told by a different author. I thought it was going to be like more of an anthology, but it's actually a book. It kind of reminds me, I said this like in my Goodreads review, it's like a more diverse YA version of Love Actually. So if you like those books that, or those movies or books that have like intertwining storylines that you think like don't really have anything to do with each other, but like have an overarching plot thread, I would definitely recommend this book. Um, it's also very short so you can read it pretty quickly, um, but as I said it takes place in Atlanta during a snowstorm and there's these multiple characters who all kind of end up with people that they either don't want to be with or that they like have, you know, weird histories with and all of that. Um, and the overarching story is that there are these two characters that have kind of broken up and everyone is trying to get them back together by like midnight. So there's like a countdown aspect and it's really interesting the way all the stories are like interwoven. I enjoyed it, I gave it a 3 out of 5 stars and I would definitely recommend it for the winter season. Then I read The Diamond Eye by Kate Quinn. This is a book that I got for Christmas last year and I didn't know what to read after reading Whiteout. I didn't know what I was exactly in the mood for and I was just looking at my bookshelf and I was like, you know what? That book intrigues me and I think this book is a perfect um, reason to explain why I don't film like my favorite and least favorite books of the year until after the year is over because I ended up giving this book 5 out of 5 stars and it definitely made its way onto my favorites list. So I was originally interested in this book because it follows a Ukrainian main character um, and it is a historical fiction book that follows Mila who, or Ludmila is her full name, but Mila for short, and she is the most prolific female sniper in all history ever of all time. And this book takes place during the Second World War and it's actually kind of difficult to explain because there's like multiple storylines, but one storyline is Mila like on the front lines. She has trained to become a sniper and she is working for the Red Army to defend against the Nazis who are trying to invade the Soviet Union. And um, then halfway through the book, or like a little over halfway through the book, we see her um, in Washington DC as she's kind of starting a friendship with Eleanor Roosevelt, who is the first lady at the time, um, when the Soviet delegation has come to the US Capitol. Um, and so that's like the main storyline, but there's also in the Soviet delegation storyline a marksman who is kind of like a mysterious perspective, you don't really know what's happening, um, and he is like observing. Mila, and he has like some nefarious plans. And then there are also like interstitial chapters from the perspective of Eleanor Roosevelt. And so it's really interesting how all of the different like pieces come together, and I just loved this book. I thought it was like perfectly structured. I loved the pace. I loved Kate Quinn's writing. Um, it's told from Mila's first person perspective, and you can really like feel like you are in the war, in the trenches with her. And I just love the way that she writes from Mila's perspective because Mila is like a young mother, she's dealing with like a divorce as well, and it's like all just very like 
interesting. There's like a romance aspect to this book as well. Um, and I really loved the historical piece of the story. Um, there were some like weird things that I didn't love about like her being like technically Ukrainian but always like assuring that she was Russian and then there was like the author would always say the Ukraine which is like very politically incorrect. So that's like minor things but they didn't like detract from the overall story for me so definitely 5 out of 5 stars and I will be talking about it a little bit more in my favorite books of the year list. Then I read three books in one day. I read Comfort and Joy by Kristen Hanna, Midwinter Murder by Agatha Christie, and Hidden Sea by Gregory Maguire. And I'm not really going to talk about these books because I talked about them at length in my 24-hour readathon, which I will link in the description box below. After those three books, after that 24-hour readathon, I also read Signal Moon by Kate Quinn, which is a Amazon original short story that I was interested in. And this is actually very interesting. It actually kind of has a fantastical flair to it. Um, and it follows these two main characters. One is a code breaker during um, World War II, I think. Um, and the other one is in like present day and they have this mysterious phone connection and it's really interesting. It's also very short, but I still ended up giving it four out of five stars. I thought the characters were really interesting despite having like, you know, despite this being a really short book, I feel like they were really interesting, but I did find myself wanting this book to be a full length story because there was definitely room for it, but I can understand why like Kate Quinn might not want to do that because this is like kind of an experimental story, but overall I would recommend it, especially if you're looking for like a short story to read with great characters and a really interesting plot. Then I read Window Shopping by Tessa Bailey. This is another book that I got for Christmas like a, a year or two ago. And this follows an ex-convict named Stella who ends up coming back to New York or coming to New York City and she gets a job at this store called Vivant to be a window dresser for the holiday season and meets the guy that owns the company named Aiden. Do I need to go on? Like, <laughs> it's a romance book. You can probably assume what happens. And I gave this book, like, a 2 out of 5 stars. I thought it was okay, but I was just like, I feel like this would be a great 100-page short story, but as a 250-page full-length novel, it kind of missed the mark for me. I think, like, my ideal romance book would have really strong plotline to supplement characters and romance. Like, romance just will not do it for me in a book alone, and that's what this was, and that's why I think it would be a good short story, because those are able to focus on the romance, like, most prominently, and don't really have to worry about the plot a lot. There were just a lot of chapters throughout this book where I was, like, begging for them to be over, and it also took me, like, three or four days to read this book, and it's still, like, short. Even though it's, like, a novel, it's still, like, only 250 pages. So, I feel like that's a good indicator of my enjoyment of the story, but, I mean, the characters were fine, and I, the romance was, like, okay to read about, but just, like, the plot really didn't, like, carry the weight of the story like it should. Then I read an interesting book, and that was Always in December by Emily Stone. This, um, I thought it was, like, a romance book, just because of, like, the cover and, like, the title and the synopsis on the back, but it's definitely not. It's more of, like, a women's fiction story. Um, on the back it says it's similar to Me Before You. I've never read that, but I do know the story of it, and I would definitely agree with that. It follows these two main characters. Um, the first one is Josie, and she is dealing with a lot of grief. Um, it's the Christmas season, and she has never really been a big fan of Christmas because it is the same time of year that her parents both died on the same day when she was very young, and she has a tradition every Christmas to mail them a letter. And one year when she is on the way to the post office, she ends up running into, literally, a man named Max, and they have this like whirlwind romance, it's kind of like ships passing in the night, and they end up seeing each other throughout the next couple of months and like the next year. This, I, what I'm about to say might be a little bit spoilery, so you can just like skip ahead, but um, I should mention that this book does not have a happily ever after because um, it's not a romance book, like technically. Um, there is romance in it, but it's more of a like literary book, I would say, which I feel like it's a little bit mismarketed just because of the cover um, and like the title and the synopsis, but 
it's very sad. Like, the ending is very sad. So, um, yeah. No Happily Ever After, which I was expecting. And I actually loved, like, this book is separated into parts. Um, I loved part one. I thought, I was like, this is gonna be, like, a five-star read. Like, the writing is so smooth. It's, like, smooth like butter, honestly. And I just love the way that Emily Stone was writing. I really loved the characters and their romance in part one. Part two was good. It was very solid. Part three, also very solid. And part four was pretty good up until the very end when we were leading into part five and six, um, which were kind of like the last couple chapters of the book. It just felt a little bit cheap. And I have a full Goodreads review where I go into spoilers, so you can definitely check that out. But I ended up giving this a four out of five stars, even though the ending felt a little bit like like as a reader um because it made me feel things so I feel like if an author is able to evoke such strong emotions from the reader the book deserves a good rating so four out of five stars for this but proceed with caution because there is no happily ever after and I feel like that's important to mention then after that I decided to read three picture books because I wanted to be able to read 110 books in the year, um, and also because I just needed a break from, like, that sad story. So I read Bear's First Christmas, Frosty the Snowman, and The Christmas Hat. I really enjoyed all of these picture books. I have revisited them multiple times. I reread The Christmas Hat every single year. It's one of my favorite, like, picture books, and I, I just love it so much. It's so cute. Um, and I love ending the year with it every year. Um, and Frosty the Snowman, of course, is just like, this is just like a printed version of like the song, Carol, whatever. And Bears for Christmas is also very cute. It's like a wintery type of story. So yeah, Christmas has like five out of five. Bears, they're all five out of five. I mean, they're great. They're classic picture books. Um, and I love them a lot. But that is all for this video. I really hope you guys enjoyed. All of my social media links are in the description box below. And I will see you soon for a new video. Bye!